I'm Mike King, along with Donald Davidson. We're here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Hall of Fame Museum. Time to turn back the clock to 1971 for Indy 500, the classics. And Donald, certainly a 1971, an interesting year because a young car owner by the name of Roger Penske brought his driver here, and it looked that they were a shoe-in for the pool. Yes, Mark Donahue, everybody figured that that was the combination. Uh, Bruce McLaren had lost his life the year before, and uh, there was a McLaren team at the Speedway, and they also did something that Bruce McLaren would not have done. They sold a new car. Roger Penske bought it, and everybody thought, that's the combination that's going to win the pole and the race. But you never know at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Let's find out what happens to Roger Penske's entry. Mark Donahue in 1971 as we pick up practice and qualifying for the 500. Of course, you can learn a lot about your engine on a dynamometer, but there's only one place to test the whole package. That's on the racetrack at high speed. Which brings us to Mark Donahue and Roger Penske. The two of them caused members of the racing fraternity to lose a lot of sleep and say a lot of bad words. Generally, racers do not practice witchcraft, but a Donahue Cupid doll with pins in the accelerator foot spent the month in Gasoline Alley. While on the track, Donahue kept raising the unofficial speed record a little bit every day. Most people suspicioned it might be in the chassis design. But Penske wasn't talking, and it seemed that even the electrician testing the scoreboard was prejudiced in Mark's favor. Speeds climb and tumble. <laughs> Where do you find the extra mile an hour you desperately need? Drivers struggle to communicate with their mechanics. It's somewhat like telling a doctor where you hurt, but different because in this case, you only know what the machine won't do. On Friday, May 14th at 6.15 p.m., time runs out. This is the draw for the lineup to qualify. George Bignani gets 15th for Al Unser and 24th for Joe Leonard. Lloyd Ruby is 34th man out. A.J. Foyt is 4th. And Penske drawing for Donahue gets 5th. Those who draw a low number have the advantage in that they qualify soon after 11 a.m. on Saturday. The wind is still down. The track temperature is comparatively cool. This is beyond strategy or mechanical skill. It's just plain luck of the draw. Many people prefer qualifications to the race. The four-day battle for positions is very interesting and frequently spectacular. Mike Mosley, first out to qualify, hits the North Chute wall. Moments later, his slightly damaged car is towed past the pits. A reminder that there never has been or will be an easy way to win a place in this race for tomorrow. Now, perhaps you don't follow auto racing. We will therefore recount that A.J. Foyt is a three-time Indianapolis 500 victor, a two-time pole winner, and a many-time USAC national champion. He has a southern drawl. He's from Houston, Texas, you all and a difficult disposition if you bother him while he's working on his car. And why not? He came here to go racing. Mark Donahue of Minia, Pennsylvania goes out as Foyt comes in. His speed, 174.317. Good for the outside spot in the second starting row. Donahue turns it on. The question now is, can he do today what he's been doing all month? The speed is 177.087. A new record, certainly, but not the 180 he has been after. Then, for the second time in a day, Mike Mosley crashes. This time, the damage is more serious. But worse than that, Mosley, who was a veteran driver and recent winner at Trenton, can't figure out whether it's him or the car. Balancer has been running all month in the mid-170s. Consider that 10 years ago, 150 miles per hour was the speed barrier. 
Al's car owner and advisor, Parnelli Jones, is the man who broke that 150 mile per hour barrier back in 1962. Al's mechanic, George Bignotti, turned the wrenches for Foyt's first win in 1961. And right now, Al figures that a speed of 174.622, which earns him a second row position, is a good place to start out for a second 500 win. Then Peter Revson springs his little surprise. His car is a McLaren, like Donahue's, and Mark is not very happy as he sees the speed climb higher and higher. 178.696, a new record, surpassing Donahue's speed by more than a mile and a half per hour. And that is certainly good for the pole spot. Joe Leonard held the pole position in 1968 and in the race that followed came within a few laps of winner circle. His car, like Al Unser's, is owned by Parnelli Jones and Val Militich. His speed of 172.761 is faster than the record set in 1968 and the third row looks pretty good. Dan Gurney has retired as a driver. Now he worries Bobby Unser over the line at a speed of 175.816 miles per hour. And that makes two Unsers in the show. The gentleman from Wichita Falls, Texas. 173.821 for Lloyd Ruby and hopes of better things to come. Mario Andretti's four-lap average of 172.612 is well within the speed range of that select first three-row starting group. This will be Mario's seventh Indianapolis race. He won in 1969, took third in 1965, and picked up three national championships along the way. Then Larry Dixon, a two-time USAC sprint car champion, takes his turn. The first day comes to an end. There are three days to go and ten places remaining. Mike Mosley makes it. Rick Mufer, Laguna Beach, California. Bud Tinglestad, Speedway, Indiana. Now is the time for precision and midnight oil. Qualified cars are dissected, inspected, and then reassembled. And for those still not qualified, there's a chance to make the field. By now, you begin to understand that it's more than an auto race. It's an individual experience. If your name is Bruce Walkup, you just kissed the car goodbye, and then somehow kept it off the wall. If your name is Bobby Unser Jr., you're watching and learning. If your name is George Bignani, there's time to eat a snow cone in the afternoon. And if your name is Steve Krisloff, you just bought the wall, and now you're a veteran. As he has done on countless occasions, Harlan Fangler instructs a rookie on how to qualify. The rookie is Denny Zimmerman from Glastonbury, Connecticut, and he's in the race. Sam Sessions is behind the wheel, and the car under that new paint job is the one that sat in winner's circle last year. Now Sessions pushes over the 170 mile per hour mark. Mr. Agajanian and friends are very, very happy. Now, George Fulmer of Arcadia, California makes it six in the race from the West Coast. Chris Loft brings it in just under 170 miles per hour. And now a story in devotion to a lost cause. Jim 
Sotheby's has a thing for the Indianapolis Roadster, but the three miles per hour he needs to be competitive against rear engine cars just isn't there. runs out slowly for Bob Harkey, the qualifier with the slowest speed of the field. And that's it. The fastest 33 have been selected. So a bit of a surprise in 1971. It's not Mark Donahue on the pole, Donald. It is Peter Revson. Yeah, it's uh, quite a story. Uh, Donahue went out earlier, as we saw, and Revson went out late. And uh, the story is that they were driving similar cars, that Donahue had requested a certain setup from his crew, which the crew wouldn't give him. And uh, he was a little upset about that and figured that he could have won the pole with the, the setup that he wanted. And uh, after his interviews were done, he was walking back up the qualifying line, ran into Revson, and Revson said what happened, and Donahue proceeded to tell him and uh, even uh, told him the setup that he would have wanted. And uh, after he left, uh, the, the story is that Revson then told the crew they dialed it into their car and knocked Donahue off the pole. How about that? Well, uh, it was uh, Peter Revson on the pole. He brings him to the green flag, the start of the 1971 Indianapolis 500. into four groups. The fastest, the medium speed, the slowest, and Mark Donahue, who runs away from everyone. way out in front with Bobby Unser and Peter Revson far enough back so that they don't become a nuisance. Dennis Holm, Revson's teammate, spins. He's safe, the car is not damaged. The speed holds up well above 166 miles per hour. Rick Muther has trouble and heads for the pits. As does Dennis Holm following his spin. Peter Revson and Bobby Unser duel for second in the straightaway. Just a wisp of smoke from the back of Krisloff's car and suddenly it becomes a stream of oil. Krisloff. Mel Kenyon. Andretti. And Gordon Johncock. Others spin wildly to avoid the wreckage. Krisloff coasts to a stop. For him and three others, the race has ended almost before it begins. Al and Bobby Unser come through as the emergency crews go about their jobs with rapid efficiency. The green flag is out at the start of the 30-second lap. And Mario takes a long, leisurely stroll back to the pits. Donahue continues his run for the money. Three hundred thousand pairs of eyes watch the race. Among them are trained observers, usually retired race drivers who study the cars closely for the first sign of trouble. The effect is almost like slow motion. And many accidents have been averted by a warning given in time. Sam Sessions is out for the day. And Clint Bronner heads for the garage, but he's had his share of pole sitters and a winner, too. 
In the 50th lap, Donahue makes a pit stop, surrenders the lead to Joe Leonard, who passes to Bobby Unser, and then back to Donahue in the 65th lap. He records the fastest speed of the race, 174.961 miles per hour, then coasts into the turn four infield with a shattered gearbox. It was a gallant run, but the idea, of course, is to finish. The upper main straightaway begins to look like a graveyard for expensive speed creations. From the 67th lap till the 118th lap, a duel between teammates makes history. The lead passes from Al Unser to Joe Leonard and back again. There are four lead changes in rapid succession as Lloyd Ruby, Peter Revson, and Bobby Unser keep pace with the dueling drivers. lap, Lloyd Ruby moves to the front for three circuits, passes to Bobby Unser, and then in the main straightaway, David Hobbs blew an engine. Rick Muther was right behind him at that moment. The rest you can see. Al Unser got through safely. So did A.J. Foyt and others, as Harlan Fangler slowed the field. The caution light is on. Al Unser comes in for 14 seconds to top off his tanks. He had made a pit stop about 15 laps before. Now he's back running with full tanks. are cleared away from the main straight. The green flag comes out as Joe Leonard pits. He leaves behind a cloud of smoke and coasts slowly around the track. His turbocharger failed and now the hope of the Johnny Lightning Samsonite team rests with Al Unser, who leads with his brother Bobby in close pursuit. Sixty-fifth lap. A wheel comes off Mike Mosley's car, and Bobby Unser has a choice to make: hit Mosley or hit the wall. As it turned out, they both piled into cars parked earlier by Chris Loff and Mark Donahue. Bobby is shaken but unhurt. Mosley is hospitalized. And while this is going on, Lloyd Ruby experiences that annual frustration which appears to be becoming the rule rather than the exception. At one time or another, Lloyd Ruby has led almost every 500 since 1966, only to have it end for him like this. For Bobby, the long walk back. And for little brother, the green flag, the lead and clear sailing with only Peter Repson on the same lap with him. The last 11 laps are quiet, uneventful, except perhaps for those butterflies in Al's stomach as he gets closer to the finish. The checkered flag, Al Unser has done it. He has won his second Indianapolis 500. Peter Repson is second by 23 seconds. A.J. Foyt shows up in third. And Denny Zimmerman, he finished eighth, made Rookie of the Year, and took home $27,000. Al Unser has just joined a very select group of men. Those that have won the 500 back-to-back. -back. Maury Rose, Wilbur Shaw, Bill Vukovic, and now Al Unser. The average winning speed of 157.735 is a new record for the 500.
they'll have to make that 48 out of 55. 1911 to 1971, 60 years of progress in a fast-moving world where tomorrow's ideas for automotive performance and safety are proven here during the month of May. The crowd is gone. There's a few minutes to reflect on the fast month just passed. Down there a couple of hours ago, Al Unser received his ovation. Behind him, a long line of 500 winners stretching back to 1911. And behind them, the men who work and plan for the race for tomorrow. So Big Al wheels it into victory lane following the 1971 Indianapolis 500. Donald, interesting to note that he did not come here as the favorite, despite the fact that he was the defending champion. But Al always brings him home, and he was the fourth person to win the race two years in a row, and that would be the last time we'd see Firestone in victory lane until 1996. Of course, that would be Buddy Lazier's first win here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So Big Al is the winner, Al Unser Sr., the winner of the 1971 Indianapolis 500. We thank you for being with us. For Donald Davidson, I'm Mike King. Join us again next time for another Indy 500, the classic.